it's a, such a great honor here to welcome everybody to our third installation of our colloquium series in our, human, our annual humanities research um, colloquium series. This is uh, just such a great opportunity to hear about the fantastic work of our fellows and graduates. You'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I'm Professor Jesse Mills in the Ethnic Studies Department and also the outgoing chair of Collaborative Research in the Humanities Center. And it's been a real honor to work with the Keck program and the team, including Lindy and Autry. And we have also Dr. Floyd joining us today. So you'll hear more from them. I uh, also wanted to briefly uh, acknowledge that we're, those of us um, working at USD are on the ancestral homeland of the Kumeyaay Nation. And we recognize the importance, the centrality of the sovereignty of the Kumeyaay people. And really, um, hopefully we're all dedicating ourselves to understanding more how we can support and get behind Kumeyaay sovereignty as our futures depend upon it. Um, so with that, I'd like to again, welcome everyone and our fellows uh, and, our, and graduates who are really excited to hear from today. And I would like it to pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Atre Fukan. Thank you so much, Professor Mills. Um, I'm the um, um, Atre Fukan, the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Program. Um, and just before I go into my um, short speech about how wonderful the research is, has been this past year and all these years, um, I hope we can just all thank Professor Mills for being the first faculty member um, to lead and um, kind of um, and just guide students through the, the first installment of the Keck Fellows Program, um, and also as an element chair of the Humanities Center. So thank you so much, um, Jesse. Um, so this, this um, symposium um, is usually um, uh, a celebration of, is always actually a celebration of student research over a whole year. Um, one of the special things about this colloquium is that it's, um, it helps to bring students together from a wide variety of disciplines, um, showcasing interdisciplinary research anchored in the humanities. Um, so it's unique to um, one of the, uh, some of the student presentations that we have at USD. Um, and one of the things we, one of the reasons why we wanted to um, kind of honor it in this formal kind of presentation is also so that students can share their research with each other, um, because sometimes it happens in silos within departments. Um, so usually all the Keck fellows and all the humanities majors are at one time, but we, since we had such a huge number this year, we had to spread it out. Otherwise you would all have been sharing together. Um, Professor Mills and I also are trying a new format this year. Um, not only because it's on Zoom, but also because we're actually asking the students to present mostly to each other um, and then ask questions of each other from the research, um, from each other's research projects. Um, we have Dr. Floyd from English to help facilitate this discussion. So we thank you so much for, um, you know, um, honoring us with your presence and for your, um, for that facilitation. Thank you so much. Thank you also to the faculty mentors who've taken their time to come um, in this last semester, last week of the semester. Um, and before I sort of um, hand it over to Dr. Floyd, I want to also thank Lindy Via so much the, um, the co who, for coordinating all the logistics, uh, for being there for um, whatever our needs are and for so much of your vision for this program as well. So thank you. Um, Dr. Floyd, passing it over to you. Um, if you want to say anything, otherwise the students know exactly what they have to do. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fukan. I effectively just simply want to thank you for including me in this wonderful event. I'm excited to hear what students have been doing and um, I'm looking forward to our conversations and discussions later on. So that's it for me. This is a project that's been very personal to me and personal to my life. So I've been very passionate about it and I have a lot to say. Um, but basically, hi, I'm Claire. Um, the title of my presentation is The Shadow of Shame, um, LGBT Assimilation versus Liberation in Western Culture and Media. And um, basically what I'll be focusing on in this presentation is kind of the psychology of shame and who it disproportionately effects and how that's been kind of perpetuated and can be solved by media representation. 
Um, so first, just a little brief overview of kind of the psychology of shame. Um, shame is actually considered one of the self-conscious emotions, which means that it develops later on in life than um, stuff like more innate things like pain, happiness, um, sadness, stuff like that. Um, it requires both an awareness of the self and of group norms um, and the capacity to kind of evaluate that you have not in some way matched up to those norms, like you don't meet the standard. Um, and it differs from guilt in that guilt is kind of the knowledge that you've done something bad um, that you can then improve your behavior upon, whereas shame is the sense that like you are bad, there's something inherently wrong with you, which is very destabilizing, demobilizing, paralyzing, and can seriously affect kind of your quality of life. Um, and this has specifically affected, um, I mean, it affects anyone who doesn't match kind of the standard of like, the prioritized straight, white, male, able-bodied person. Um, but specifically, I wanted to talk about how it's affected the LGBT experience. Um, things like isolation, repression, and shame are intrinsic to many members of the LGBT community. Um, it's affected my own life as a bisexual woman. Um, and this is a quote that I found from this wonderful article called The Dignity of Queer Shame that I think is really great. So I'm just gonna read it. Um, when I came out to my father in the 1970s, he responded that some things are better left unsaid. That blatant demand for my silence was a kind of symbolic violence, an attempt at censoring me or imagining the erasure of my sexuality and shutting me out for my differences. And while this is one person's personal experience, um, this has been perpetuated on the systemic level by things like don't ask, don't tell, which um, allowed gay people to serve in the military as long as they didn't mention their sexuality and really horribly um, in the AIDS crisis. Whereas you can kind of see in this bottom picture, the slogan silence equals death, where basically the shame of AIDS being associated with gay people resulted in little to no action being done until way too late. Um, and then I wanted to kind of focus on how this has been shown in the media. Um, so basically in Hollywood in 1934, at the request of religious groups, um, Hollywood kind of enforced like a self-enforcing um, censorship program where um, anything considered sexual perversion was banned from being released in the cinemas and on TV. Um, and this primarily affected LGBT characters, which were then al not allowed to be shown unless they were punished for their behavior, which resulted in either no representation or representation in which characters were usually killed by the end of the movie. Um, and these are some quotes from the 1995 documentary, The Celluloid Closet, about this phenomenon. Um, the bottom one in particular, I think is super significant. Um, this man describes the experience of feeling like something dreadful was going to happen to him for his sexuality um, and that he kind of began to feel like he deserved it because this was the only future that he saw for himself. These characters like him suffering, which was very isolating for him. And then kind of in the aftermath of the Hayes Code, which was officially abolished in 1968, but has had lasting ramifications. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, the ideas of assimilation versus liberation in the media. Um, so this can kind of be seen as like acceptance versus freedom from the system. So kind of a case study of this is the same story told in two different movies. Um, one is Le Cage à Faux, which is a French movie, and the other is The Birdcage, which you might have heard of. It stars Robin Williams. Basically, the plot is that um, these two gay men, they have a son who wants to bring his fiance home to meet the um, family, but his fiance's family is extremely conservative and won't approve of the parents. So they hatch this plan to pretend to be straight. Um, without Albert, who is played by Robin Williams, is knowledge because he's too flamboyant to pass as straight. Um, and basically in La Cage à Folle, their action to do this behind his back is portrayed as really horrible, like someone that this man trusts want him to be someone that he's not. Um, however, in The Birdcage, it's, he's kind of presented as the butt of the joke. Like this man, it's so funny that he's flamboyant and he doesn't fit in. Um, and at the end, they managed to accept him despite this after putting him through that kind of really horrible embarrassment. So um, this would kind of be seen as the Kaja Fole as an example of liberation, whereas the bird cage is kind of an example of assimilation. 
and I'll go more into that. Um, here are some examples of liberation in the media, specifically from shame. Um, one of my favorite TV shows, Black Sails, um, centers really around the whole plot centers around the conversation of shame and the systems of shame. So in the show, um, basically instead of bending to the will of an oppressive system, Captain James Flint uh, forces the system to bend to him by becoming the world's most notorious pirate and waging war on the entire British empire. Um, his story centers on his relationship with shame and how it has impacted his life and how difficult it is to overcome. Um, the show goes into a lot of more intricacies, specifically slavery, um, freedom for women, all kinds of things. But um, one of my favorite quotes from it is, this ends when they beg for my forgiveness, not the other way around. And that's basically one man referring to the whole system, um, which I think is a pretty radical idea. Um, and then kind of a very different movie, but um, with a similar idea is the movie Big Eden. Um, this is a movie from 2000. And uh, in this movie, the characters of a small Montana town realize that um, they've done some serious damage to a member of their community that they love and um, would like to support. And they realize that it is up to them to apologize for teaching this man shame and acknowledge their role in teaching it and know that it is up to him to forgive them, not up to them to accept him. So these are two examples of how um, liberation can be shown in the media, how it is important for um, the society to accept that like they've done something wrong. It's not up to um, the gay person to bend to them. Like you kind of have to accept people for who they are. Um, and then finally, uh, this is an example from the TV show Scum. This is a Norwegian show that gained a lot of popularity. Um, the name literally means shame in Norwegian. Um, and this is a great example of how um, LGBT, LGBT people have internalized this shame. Um, even when you accept that you're gay, you often feel like, well, I, I'm not like those other flamboyant people. I don't want to be like that. Um, I want to be accepted. And um, yeah, so this show kind of tackles this. And I think the most important thing is that it discusses LGBT people as intentional, not just incidental victims of shame. This is a systemic issue. And um, the really radical idea that LGBT people, given the opportunity, would not want to be straight. Um, I mean, it'd be great to have full rights and everything, but um, it's not like, uh, I think there's this mentality of, oh, I mean, those poor people, given the chance they would wanna be heterosexual, they would wanna be normal. And that's just not the case. Um, and I think that LGBT people tend to internalize that idea that um, you know, there's something wrong. I would like to be normal. Um, and shows like this really provide the opportunity to um, assess that mentality and where it's coming from, because often is, it is coming from a place of feeling that shame. And again, reiterating that idea from Black Sales that society should change for LGBT people to accept it rather than the other way around, which um, I think is a very interesting idea and is kind of the basis of my research. But um, that's it. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Katarina. Uh, my major is interdisciplinary humanities with an emphasis in English and uh, my minors are Chinese and international business. So the title of my project is Beyond Language Barriers, Opportunities and Challenges Presented by Multilingualism. Uh, I'm doing this project uh, because I think that language is a very powerful tool and communication dominates our daily lives, whether it be at work, at home, abroad, or in a social settings. Um, also, this research is very personal, special to me because I'm from Ukraine and I'm multilingual. I speak five languages and I always want to learn more. Uh, at first, uh, when I started doing this project uh, last semester, I was going to research the benefits and disadvantages of multilingualism. But as I started going deeper into the research, I realized that it is a very big topic, so I decided to narrow it down and I'm going to compare and contrast language situations in the United States and in Ukraine. So the first scientific studies on multilingualism date back to the early 20th century 
And one of the first to address this issue was the German linguist Maximilian Brown in his work Reflection on the Issue of Multilingualism. And I found this research very interesting because in it, the scientist considers multilingualism as an active, balanced, and perfect command of two or more languages. And given this definition, the scientist distinguished between natural multilingualism, it's the one you inherit from birth, and artificial multilingualism in particular acquired in the learning process. Uh, multilingualism, or at least bilingualism, is a feature of the majority of the world's population as a result of processes such as globalization, migration, and colonization. And the United States is a very diverse country. But why the US education system lags behind in reflecting the value of multilingual society? If we use the number of official languages as an indicator of monolingualism or multilingualism, it is very difficult to call the United States even a monolingual state because the US doesn't have an official language at the state level. And uh, there are countries for which bilingualism is the norm for all educated citizens. And an example of this would be Ukraine. And I'm going to talk about it later in my presentation. Uh, so according to the statistics from the US Center for Applied, St um, Applied Linguistics, English is not native language for every fifth US citizen. Most often bilingualism is formed as a result of mastering the first native language and learning a second language by immersion in a foreign language environment or through learning. Um, most children in American immigrant families can be considered naturally bilingual because first and second language acquisition occurs almost simultaneously from early childhood. In the United States, English plays two roles, a first native language and a second language for ethnic minorities. Uh, the biggest obstacle to bilingualism and the spread of bilingual education programs in the United States was the English only movement. And in 1998, the state of California adopted proposal 227 uh, and the essence of which uh, was to terminate bilingual education programs and introduce programs in English only. I found it very interesting because according to this proposal, the assimilation of American citizens was considered a more important pro process than multiculturalism. Uh, although in many states schooling is based on bilingualism, language education in the United States is leading to the displacement of heritage languages. Also, while doing this research, I found that a lot of American people tend to overthink the process of learning a foreign language, and they often see it uh, as something they were forced to do. So many of them struggled with it, and they developed a culture of excuses. And the reality is that Americans are no different than any other group when it comes to being able to learn a foreign language, and with the right tools and mindset, it is completely possible. And I think bilingualism in America is a very achievable dream. So in the next part of my research paper, I am analyzing multilingualism in Ukraine. And it is a very unique situation because Ukrainian multilingualism is mostly a de facto Ukrainian Russian bilingualism. And Ukrainian is the predominant language in the Western part of Ukraine, while Russian is predominant in much of the Eastern part. Both languages are spoken widely in the capital of Ukraine and a large population of the and a large proportion of the population speaks both fluently. Also, television is often bilingual and books, stores, everywhere you go, people would understand you if you speak Ukrainian or Russian. But language has become a much more sensitive issue since 2014 when a pro-Russian ex-president was toppled in a popular revolt and Russia responded by annexing the Crimea region and backing a pro-Russian separatist uprising in the eastern part of Ukraine. And these acts, they caused a civil war in Ukraine. And right now, Ukrainian government imposed laws to ban Russian language in the whole country. So in the current situation in Ukraine, the phenomenon of multilingualism brings with certain new opportunities and chances, as well as threats and challenges. And the problem of Ukrainian-Russian bilingualism in Ukraine is extremely complex and controversial. 
After all, the functioning of two officially established languages in one country, violating the linguistic and cultural unity of its inhabitants, it becomes a source of constant conflicts between two multilingual parts of the population, and also it becomes a destabilizing factor in public life. So I know my project is a little or disorganized right now, I'm still working on it, but to conclude my presentation, um, the reason for learning a new language are varied, but the importance of learning foreign languages is universal. It will always benefit you in one way or another. And as a British scholar and author, Nicholas Osler said, different languages protect and nourish the growth of different cultures, where different pathways of human knowledge can be discovered. They certainly make life richer for those who know more than one of them. And this is it. And thank you so much. All right, my name is Delaney Tax. I'm a 2020 2021 Keck Fellow. Um, and my research is titled The Urban Spatial Bodies, Knowledges, and Transcendence in the Built Environment. My exploration into the implications of the built environment derives the theory central to this work which is colonial urban planning or spatial, temporal, and ideological instances of power enforcement that define the space and the individuals within. This investigation uses the concept of colonial urban planning to frame the various spatial, temporal, and ideological implications of white supremacy and Western domination. This work conceptualizes colonial urban planning through which, <laughs> excuse me, through, through which urban theory surrounding capitalism and identity politics arises which contributes to the methods of urban control and the structuring of power itself. In doing so, this analysis focuses specifically on the conceptions of race, gender, and queerness within the Western cis-heteropatriarchy. This dictates what individuals and communities are considered normal and therefore hold power within colonization. This power manifests through ideology construction, spatial organization, and economic exploitation within the city. At the center of colonial urban planning lies a question of how normative applications of planning negotiate the presence or absence of a just city and the communities on the land. By using case studies of colonial urban form in both historical and contemporary manifestations, the thesis dissects out the ways in which bodies are purposefully raised, gendered, and queered by architectural planning itself in order to maintain or implement imperialist power structures. The colonial constructions of both dominant planning and dominant identities as good and normative leverages the power the state has over individual bodies and their access to space. Thresholds, barriers, and areas of contestation arise out of both physical contact zones and ideology made prevalent through urban symbolism. It is within these spaces of contact and access and inaccess that I investigate the intentional identity politics and subsequent ideological control that arises from planning. This study shows that the built environment is central to the construction of identities and belonging, and colonial urban planning becomes a, becomes a self-regulating phenomenon along modes of restriction and access. And this is the quote that I center my definition of colonial urban planning around, so by Dr. Rupa Myra, which is, quote, to be colonized means to be disconnected and disintegrated from our ancestry, from our earth, from our indigeneity, and our earth-connected self. From this, the question of subjective realities formed by urban structure arises. How are urban form forms ideologically and physically constructed to frame the experience of bodies included in, separated by, or excluded from the space? How does the body experience gendering and racialization while engaging in the purposeful construction of urban forms? Using an interdisciplinary approach, I investigate the engendering of knowledges onto bodies through the urban experience. I explore the type of thresholds and barriers present within the urban planning practices in conjunction with varying modes of identity construction. These identity constructions include social and political locations deemed as important by structures of power, as well as those emphasize the resistances to structures of power. I do this through specific case studies, including Le Cabousier's French plans for French colonial Alger that use racialized and gendered understanding of Algerian bodies to restrict movement and enact colonial urban planning, which you see on the top left. The gender tourist economy of Little Italy that creates a heterotopia of a non-space representing extractive capitalism on the top right. And California mission system architecture and its impacts on the University of San Diego's campus, which architecturally represents a pseudo history twice removed on the bottom. The second half of my work looks at resistances through colonial urban planning through third space. 
I use Bell Hooks theory of marginality and Edward Sojo's definition of third space to quote simultaneously as quote simultaneously real and imagined and more that can be described and inscribed in journeys to real and imagined places end quote. This identifies and conceptualizes these other places as sites of resistance to colonial urban planning. This bell hook quote states, quote, this is an intervention, a message from the space in the margin that is a site of creativity and power that includes the space where we recover ourselves, where we move in solidarity to erase the category colonizer, colonized, end quote. If we were to move past these thresholds to liberate ourselves from the implications of colonial space and the ways in which our bodies are acting grounds for it, we must rethink our relationship to space itself. We must not shy away from the margins, but rather recognize them and use this recognition to reconstruct space for the benefit of the disenfranchised. Rooting in Michel Foucault's heterotopology and heterotopias, or spaces that defy current historical social binaries to be other, both, and existent and non-existent all at once. For my analysis of colonial urban planning allows these expansions of what Hooks calls the margins into third space resistance. Again, I'm concerned with the University of San Diego's campus and the spatial temporal location of the commons in my case study. Utilizing Catherine McKittrick's Black Feminist Geography, I argued that geographic orientation of identity places rely on what she calls, quote, predetermined stabilities, end quote, that enforce and reinforce the wear of race, gendered, and queered subjectivities to specific containers that recreate other modes of oppression. Interacting with the faux colonial architecture couture of the campus instills an inability to adequately make space for inclusion. I look at the development of guerrilla inclusion spaces, such as activism groups that resist both the colonial implications of the university and identity containers to create a physical and non-physical geographic and marginal temporality. So as Bill Hook says, marginality is a space of resistance. We'll enter that space, let us meet there. We greet you as liberators. Thank you. What an impressive set of work we're hearing today. This is amazing. Um, I'm delighted to be invited into a space of resistance. So let's continue this with our final speaker today. My name is Mackenzie Nichol. I'm an architecture major with a minor in art history. And my project is titled Force Flex Dance. So just a little overview before I get started. Um, the project I've been working on investigates the relationship between the body and space through oblique architecture and performance art. So in particular, I've been studying um, an object called the Stefan polyhedron and a collection of postmodern dances, um, as well as postmodern performance art theory to examine the response of the body to a sense of disequilibrium and a heightened awareness of space and structure due to our experience of gravity um, that's heightened as we traverse um, topology or inclined planes. Um, so this is just kind of a map of kind of all the background information that gets me to um, kind of my, my suggestion of the Stefan polyhedron, the object I'm working with as an architectural basis for a mutual performance between the body and architecture. So I just wanted to touch on gravity and disequilibrium. Um, gravity is of course the context of our human experience through which we perceive. Um, it places us on the horizon, um, which means of course that our, um, our point of equilibrium is naturally um, horizontal. So, um, of course, the history of architecture basically is unchallenged in that it favors that horizontality because obviously we favor um, equilibrium. So when that orientation is changed and our equilibrium is disrupted, um, our center of gravity shifts and we become aware of that force on our bodies. So like as we kind of sit in regular architecture that's flat, um, we're not, we can kind of ignore gravity because we don't feel like the fatigue or the resistance to acceleration that we experience when we are walking up or down a hill. So it forces our bodies to react kinesthetically. Um, so a little bit about orthogonal architecture versus oblique architecture. Um, orthogonal architecture is basically kind of the fancy way of just talking about everyday architecture. It is um, structure that imposes horizontality and verticality onto the topological shape of the earth, um, which as I said before, it favors equilibrium. 
So it kind of promotes the relaxation of the body through rigid still structure um, that allows us to kind of rest and ignore um, that force of gravity while oblique architecture is um, inclined architecture that embraces topology as architectural form and um, it activates the body by promoting circulation through an employment of gravitational forces um, disrupting equilibrium. So just a closer look at those two pictures. Um, on the left, you can see James Dean standing. The stance is called um, contraposto. And you can see that he's using the um, orthogonal architecture and its rigidity to, um, to be at rest. While on the right, you can see um, a diagram by Paul Virilio and Claude Perrant, who were the kind of primary architects suggesting the oblique application in architecture that kind of throws the body um, into action. You can't really um, traverse like inclined planes with like in a, you can't rest on it. Um, you, you have to kind of activate your body. Um, so, and then I'm gonna sidestep to performance art. So in the 1960s and 70s, um, performance artists were kind of um, finding a collective interest in an exploration of ordinary movement as a form of dance. Um, so they were kind of moving away from uh, traditional choreography, such as ballet, um, and toward this kind of improvisational task um, type of chore choreography, which basically meant that like the choreography didn't actually dictate the movement. It just kind of instructed you to do something. Um, and then it was about kind of noticing your body as it negotiated that task. So one of the popular um, experiments was to perform on incline um, surfaces, um, which encouraged performers to become aware of their bodies as they reacted to that force of gravity. And then, um, so as I mentioned, Paul Virilio and Claude Perrant were the primary architects that were suggesting the oblique um, as an application for architecture. And Claude's sister, Nicole, was a dancer. And so that allowed their disciplines to kind of intersect um, and she studied dance on the oblique um, in particular, and she named this style Lanc Le Pan. So at this point, we have orthogonal structure that's static and allows the body to rest, and we have oblique structure that's static and causes the body to activate. So what my research is kind of asking is, what if we also had oblique that became dynamic with the body so that the oblique and the body are throwing it, um, each other into inter interactive disequilibrium dancing together. Um, so keep that in mind while I talk about the Stefan polyhedron object that I'm working with. So before I can introduce you to that, I need to talk about um, convexity and rigidity. So the rigidity theorem is that all convex polyhedra are rigid. What that means is that they can't be pushed or flexed into a different size or shape. So until the late 1970s with the discovery of this object, um, all non-convex polyhedra were also thought to be rigid. So on the bottom left, um, that's a convex polyhedron. So that means that all the vertices are pointing outward uh, like mountains. So if you draw a line between any two vertices of the polyhedron, that line is gonna um, remain within the boundaries of the object. A non-convex polyhedron has some vertices that point inward um, like valleys. So if you were to draw a line between any two vertices, that line may or may not lie within the boundaries of the object. So this is the Stefan polyhedron. Um, on the bottom left, you can see it unfolded. And then on the bottom right is the grasshopper model um, of its motion. So, um, it's still one of the only known non-convex polyhedra that can flex between two extreme positions while maintaining complete structural integrity. And what that means is that um, none of the edges or vertices are gonna break open um, as it flexes. So the structure is not compromised at all. So back to my question, um, what if the oblique could also become dynamic and the oblique and the body could throw one another into, into interactive disequilibrium and dance together. So my project suggests that the Stefan polyhedron serve as the basis for dynamic oblique architecture that can perform with the body. I'm just letting you guys see kind of that 
comparison of those two motions there. And that's it. Thank you. Let's give everyone a round of applause again. This is just fantastic work. And this is, of course, the time that I assume students get to ask each other questions and the rest of us get to listen in on what I hope is going to be an amazing set of considerations. And if you get stuck, Carlton will throw something in the table. So. Elaine, please. Yeah, I have a question for Mackenzie. Um, your project is so fascinating and interesting. Um, I'm curious about what you're engaging with. Like I know you have considered the relationship between a structure and the body. Um, what are you considering in terms of uh, the structure and its relationship to the site? Thank you for your question. Um, so actually, I have been exploring um, more of the kind of design aspect of the project this semester. And um, so as postmodern performance art theory suggests, performance can be whatever we want it to be. So I have decided to investigate this um, at a semi-permanent architectural scale, um, basically because it's um, a triangulation that folds and unfolds to create this structure. Um, it has a lot of aggregation possibilities, so it can be patterned together to actually create these really intricate chains. So I'm suggesting that the performance of this be sort of a social densification, so to speak, in um, master plan communities that have no more room for a permanent development. So I'm suggesting that these things can kind of like pattern together and they can be semi-permanent um, kind of residents that, um, that fill in kind of the spaces of, of master plan communities. Yeah, and then I have a question for Claire. Um, I, I don't know much about your field and what you're researching, um, but I found your project super interesting. Um, and what is the relationship? I know you're doing a lot of media studies. Um, and so I'm curious about where the kind of like kill your gaze trope kind of ties in to this, your theory that you're, you're discussing. Yeah, so I'm actually talking about that a lot in my paper. I didn't like I couldn't fit it into this presentation. But yeah, so I'm going to kind of look at that through the historical lens. So I touched on it, uh, touched on it a bit with like the Hayes Code and how, you know, like characters couldn't be shown that were gay unless they were killed at the end. And even if that's formally gone away. Like we know that hasn't really gone away. Um, LGBT characters are killed off on TV shows at a vastly disproportionate rate, specifically lesbian characters. Um, I don't know if you remember when the CW show, The 100 killed off Lexa. And that started off a whole conversation about the barrier gaze trope, um, which basically refers to the deaths of gay characters at the end of um, TV shows and movies. Um, but, uh, and specifically, I'm looking at the connection between like the fact that Lexa was killed immediately after a sex scene um, and how that kind of translates not to just like, oh, incidentally, this character was killed. This character was the death was specifically tied to this act, to the sexual act, um, which is really harmful and perpetuates the shame that you know, LGBT people already feel. Um, and that's not the only instance of that happening. I think, I can't remember the exact study, it's in my research, but um, that year, I think it was like 54% uh, of uh, LGBT care of like lesbian characters and shows were killed off that year. And that's already such a small amount. Um, I think right after that, um, the character on uh, Orange is the New Black was killed off like literally a month later. Um, so it's, yeah, so it's a very interesting, horrible trope that um, has not gone away just because um, the formal legal censorship rule has gone away. Um, I don't know, like, you know, there's a website where you can check, like, does the gay character die at the end, um, like specifically to <laughs> because it's such a big issue. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely gonna be looking at that a lot. And I think it fits in so well with the concept of shame and reinforcing it on the viewer. So thank you for the question. Does that answer it? 
Yeah, of course. I was thinking what your project got to mind, like the ending of The Haunting of Bly Manor. I don't know if you've seen that, but yeah. that reminds me a lot of like what you're you're speaking on. And of course, I've seen the 100, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so I have a question um, for Delaney. I I um I heard you say non-space um, in your presentation, and that kind of made me think. Um, actually, there's a there's a group of students in the thesis class that are kind of investigating non-space, non-place. And so I was just wondering if you've kind of considered at all, like, I mean, we kind of live in a world of non-space, non-place right now on Zoom. Um, you know, virtually we're very much in in that. So I was just wondering if you've, if you've considered um kind of your project in terms of perhaps like a virtual world at all. Yeah, definitely. Um, I and my work is also very much rooted in architecture. I have an architecture minor, and so um, I definitely got this idea from um, the kind of architecture department and engaging with that type of work. Um, but yeah, the last half of my project really looks at like third space and what that means if it's non-space and non-place, um, and in the context of placemaking and like geographic building um, in terms of online activism. Um, I'm an ethnic studies major and an organizer at heart. And um, I've been so blessed to be part of like amazing online communities, um, really doing some amazing um, placemaking, community building, like temporal spatial organizing work um, and how that that relates to our virtual space and how it is kind of like a non-space. Um, and I think a lot about um, non-space in the context of um, like different ways of understanding geography. So I'm very much rooted in black feminist geography um, and affect theory and that type of thing. And so the way that geography um, must prioritize feeling rather than like necessary necessarily place and so I think about that in the context of of non-place as well like feeling and affect theory. Uh, Katerina I think your work particularly in terms of how it looks at U.S. culture in comparison to other places <clears throat> points to one of what I consider one of our greatest flaws which is that we compel people effectively, and I'm trying to use a nice word here, to not learn a second language. <laughs> and then you get to college and we ask you to have a second language. I'm just curious about your thoughts about how our system, if you will, uh, works or doesn't work in comparison to other places. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic because um, when I came to the US, I barely spoke English and then I was going to high school here so I learned it through high school and then uh, when I came to USD I remember at the like international orientation there was like oh like if you're an international student and you already speak one language like your native language uh, other than English you don't need to take uh, language classes and I was like but I want to take language class like I want to learn some languages you know they're like no no you don't have to you already like fulfilled your language uh, requirement and I was like well it's a little it's different because like I come from a different from a different country literally everywhere go, everyone speaks Russian, uh, Ukrainian. We learn in school like English, French, like some other languages. So coming here from that culture, it was a little bit like different and interesting. But yeah, no, I think um, as I'm doing my research, I think like the language issue in the United States is a very important because um, I, um, I think that's that's what I said in my presentation. Like sometimes people think that it is very hard to learn a foreign language, and it is. But if you have enough motivation, if you like keep going and have some really good resources, it's it's possible. It's not the you know the impossible thing. Um, before I ask a question to Mackenzie, Katerina, do you want to, I'm just your advisor, so I know, but 
Do you want to share with people what language you picked, though? When you did, when you learned, you didn't have to learn a second another language. Oh yeah, I uh, first I was taking Spanish classes, and then now I'm minoring in Chinese. Yeah. So you know, to your point about how multilingualism fosters a kind of multicultural culturalism within oneself, um, it's just the journey that led you to China, to minor in Chinese is really fascinating. Um, so I had a um, question for Mackenzie. Um, by the way, I just want to say that um, I only learned all the terms that you are using, all of you are using late in my 30s. <laughs> so I feel a little intimidated to ask you all questions. But um, Mackenzie, I wanted to ask about, I really loved what you were saying about um, body and architecture dancing together. It's like a very provocative thought. Um, and I know you're looking at architecture, but I was, I was wondering um, in terms of dance, what you think of objects as architecture too. Um, you, you know, so not just sort of buildings and kind of um, your picture of people using vertical planes or <coughs> sorry, horizontal planes or vertical planes. But um, I'm actually thinking of one of my favorite dance choreographers, Martha, Martha Graham, who often used you know, chairs as a site and as architecture to speak about the domesticity of women. Um, so I was just wondering what you thought about um, non non site specific types of architecture in your in your thinking about how bodies uh, relate to gravity. Um, and I love gravity because you feel it everywhere, but you can't see it. Right? It's kind of like Claire's project about um, systemic. Um, um, oppression against um, sort of um, a queer desire, right? But anyway, I was just wondering what you thought about that. So I think, um, I think that it's very, you know, it's hard to um, separate sight and choreography because um, in ways that we don't realize it, sight and architecture and the built world do choreograph us. Um, for example, like museums are, are very much designed to guide you without having to have like a tour guide or anything. So, and um, what actually inspired this project was um, so my sophomore year, I wrote a paper about Lawrence and Anna Halfren. And Lawrence um, was a landscape architect and his wife, Anna, was a dancer. Um, and they were working in the 1960s and 70s. And they, um, their kind of work turned into this intersection where they allowed um, design and choreography to kind of intersect. So um, the interesting thing I think about architecture and dance is that both of them, well, neither of them are, um, I guess I should say both of them require representation that is not the thing itself. So we don't ever experience architecture or dance as it's represented. We ne we're never gonna see architecture as a floor plan or as a section. Um, we're never gonna like see dance as a diagram or a, a list of movements. Um, so I think, um, that's really beautiful. And I also like your, now I'm thinking of dancing through the next museum I ever get to visit once COVID is over, but um, that's really a beautiful response. Thank you. You're right. It's things that uh, guide, shape our movement, but we don't necessarily see them, right? That's what you also mean by dance. Yeah. So I think, um, I think it is, I'm not sure if choreography or just our daily movement can be separated from sight at all because um, if architecture is space and dance or movement is the time, then it becomes like a space time type of thing that's um, kind of evades representation, but also requires it. But I also had a question for Mackenzie. I don't know if this is like too broad or like overarching, but I was curious, like, what do you think, I mean, you went into a little bit, but like, what about kind of becoming aware of your gravity is important. Like, what do you think that does being in a space where you are suddenly like aware that you're being held down by gravity and kind of having to counteract that? Yeah, so I think, um, 
architecture, I guess, some, one of the ways I like to describe it is that it, it kind of is like a historical bookkeeper of society. Like, you know, it, we had to develop architecture very early on and it's just been continuing to develop, but we have two orders. We have the horizontal order and we have the uh, vertical order. So, um, you know, and that's basically unchallenged. We don't, you know, it's kind of unthinkable that we would like live on a slant. Um, what the oblique does is it allows um, the entirety of surface to be circulatory and habitable. So we can actually get rid of vertical space that's not being used because gravity pre uh, prevents us from traversing a lot of a lot of architectural elements. Like we can't use the wall and the ceiling. But if it's oblique, then it can become both surface and uh, roof. So then like complete um, usability of surface is what happens there, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. That's so interesting. Thank you. If I may, I'd like to ask a question of all of you. I have a tendency to look across um, what I'm hearing and seeing, looking for perhaps commonalities. And I found, I believe, two. So please respond in any way you feel uh, proper, including saying I'm completely wrong. But one of the things I noticed, seems to me, is that all of you are pushing against some perceived norm of social and cultural space, some idea that's kind of cemented into our ways of being in the world and seeing the world. Um, and that is, well, first of all, just delightful but also I think quite fascinating. Um, so I'd just really like you to speak for a minute if you can about how you're re-seeing the world you exist in through these uh, potentially wonderfully disruptive and uh, reforming ways. Hope that makes some sense. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that um, first. Um, I think one of the things that I've really like yeah, my kind of like central idea to my research is that um, not, bodies don't form space, space forms bodies um, and how identity is salient and constructed by um, the orientation through which we see the world. Um, and I, there's this great book um, by Sarah Ahmed called um, Queer Phenomenology. Um, and it's all about how our, it, it centers sexual orientation and how our orientation in the world like inherently queers um, specific bodies. And I think that's kind of the central, the central theme of my work and the work that I'm using um, for case studies is, yes, it's so good. Um, and uh, the, the things I'm using for case studies um, really center on this idea that like everything is very salient and normative ideas of what is good um, and just are centered in uh, like white supremacy and colonialism. And they see that um, in architecture and urban planning if we pay close enough attention to it. And then that dictates how bodies are able to access certain spaces. Um, so generally it's, um, it's a question of access and who has access to specific spaces. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I, that kind of answers the question. <laughs> I think you answered it admirably, wonderfully. Are there other responses to that question? Yeah, a lot of my life has been spent like wanting to appeal to this system, like recognizing that this system is oppressive, but like if I try hard enough, if I sacrifice enough of myself, I can be accepted by it. I can move up in it. And um, like, then I realize like whatever you move up in the system, it's at the expense of someone else. There's always people that can't sacrifice themselves, kind of like the birdcage movie, like not everyone can blend in, like not everyone is, there's always going to be something that's rejected by the system. And I think in my research, what I've like come to realize is that um, it's not like, it's not really about, um, I don't know, being accepted by the system and getting like a seat at the table or breaking through some glass ceiling, like we need to get rid of the table 
totally like <laughs> there's always going to be someone that doesn't have a seat um and i think i mean that's obviously an idea that is not original or anything but and it's very hard to implement but i think at least going through life with that mentality of you know this is like i'm going to be rejected by some type of oppressor no matter what like it I need to kind of just accept that and live my life and hope that, you know, occupy the space that I want to occupy. And like this society needs to kind of accept that about me rather than trying to futilely blend into something that you're never going to really <laughs> fully blend into. Um, and so I think kind of, yeah, this it's like it's been about not just like um, trying to move up in the system, but kind of trying to in any way possible, just through like my own actions, try to um, emphasize that the system's not okay and wanting to, not wanting to blend into it, not wanting to be accepted by it, wanting to be free of that system. So yeah, that was a really great question. I think totally applies to everything that everyone just said, um, but yeah. I'm thinking for example, in terms of Katarina's case, what we might gain culturally in a place like the United States if we recognize the diversity of languages and cultures that actually exist here. Um, I remember years ago learning that I think in Linda Vista alone, something like 90 different languages are spoken. Um, now I certainly don't wanna learn 90 languages, but it might be nice if people knew three. Right? <laughs> you know? um, what would that do to change this culture and our sense of inclusivity and uh, for McKinsey, the, the arrangement of social space, in fact, if we go back to things that others have said, Delaney and Claire in particular, says something about what you can do in that space, right? So for me, that idea of kind of reconceptualizing social space and what we can do within a gravitational field, I think is absolutely important in terms of shaping everything we're doing here. This, this was just such a, amazing panel and I, similarly to to dr floyd just have lots of thoughts going through my mind um but maybe just asking uh, one of the questions in particular i actually feel like it's maybe another version of the the prompt that you were just offering carlton but i did want to specifically ask um katarina in particular um to, to just more of your thoughts about kind of the like an english only type history or thinking about the the monolingual sort of nature of the US in terms of its cultural, um, like historical significance. Um, I, is that something that you looked at? I'm thinking in particular, like the, um, you know, the outlying of indigenous languages, the kind of like forced assimilation, almost like perceiving that anything that is not English is somehow a direct threat to like power and rulership in the settler state. Um, I'm thinking of debates around Black English, where there were attempts to have that be recognized as a language to not um, continue to create educational disparities with, um, you know, African diasporic Americans, right? Uh, and debates around that and, and how that's perceived as a threat. Um, so I'm just curious if that is something that you did look into more of like the cultural history and then um, the second part of that question being um, a, a sort of a spin on, on Carlton's question as well, kind of like, um, can we sort of one-to-one -one think of that somehow learning more languages would make us less Eurocentric and less white supremacist? So is that an automatic way to address kind of cultural hierarchy? Um, just as another spin, I think, on the, the, the kind of prompt that Carlton was giving. Uh, yes. Yeah, so... Um... There is, as I already told, there is an issue with uh, monolingualism, multilingualism in the US. And uh, when I was doing the research, I found some um, uh, documents where people say that the United States, they, they don't even have like the official state language. English is not an official uh, language of the United States because um, there are like a lot of different people, immigrants who came to the US and then uh, they, for example, like there are a lot of immigrants from Mexico, like um, South America or Europe and everyone like a lot of people speak Spanish and German. I know there's like a huge Russian Ukrainian diaspora, like a lot of people speak Russian, but also another problem uh, why um, 
United States or like a global state because um, uh, some researchers, I don't remember his name, but he said that uh, bilingualism uh, can um, affect, uh, I don't remember how I would say it, but um, bilingualism will impact uh, the learning of the second language on the speaking the first language fluently. I don't know if that makes sense. So if, like, like when you learn the second language, it will impact in a bad way your the knowledge of your first language. And uh, I found that very interesting too. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Here. I mean, I've got lots of questions, but I guess the one question I have maybe for um, Delaney is where does the question of property enter into this research? Because I think oftentimes, at least from what I gather from your, from your presentation, is that planning is really code or being conflated with the concept of property. Um, so if we take that... Um, if we assume accurately that uh, planning itself uh, is part of the colonial project, right? Emerging in the kind of end of the 18th century, early 19th century. Um, I guess the, the kind of short, quick question is before planning comes property, right? Um, so I'm wondering like where property fits into the colonial project, right? Because I think um, at least what we see in the US um, is that the introduction of private property as inherently Western uh, kind of construct um, is overlaid and then becomes justification for everything else? Yes, that's that's a big question. So I'll do my best to to answer that. But I think um, I think that ties into this kind of like triad that we have is like planning like the colonial project and then capitalism and they're all interacting um, together. Uh, I use like David Harvey's uh, work a lot and he he speaks a lot to like the issue of uh, private property in the state um, as well. And I think um, I think the the conflation of ownership and Western civilization is like has is rooted in colonialism um, and white supremacy. Um, so I think that's a huge part of uh, the work that I do. And I think, oh my gosh, there's just so much to be said about that. Um, I try to take like um, a specifically like kind of Marxist look on that type of thing, especially in my work with um, third space and non-space um, in the context of like what does it mean to look past ownership and what does necessarily like ownership and private property actually um, mean in the context of planning? So like, I guess on the, in like, I don't know, like Little Italy in my um, case study or even just like Lake Abouzier's plan Obus, like that type of like who gets to own what, like what, what body has the right to the city um, is a huge, is a, is really really especially in Lake Abouzier's plan Ovis uh, a, central to uh, the plan completely like the Caspa is destroyed and either kept for um, museum purposes um, in order to bring in a tourist economy um, or distributed to the the lesser like Algerian class um, as like the sort of slums or preserved for the settler state. Um, so I think that that kind of that kind of answers it. Like, I think there's the the call of my work is to move past ownership because it's part of this triad of uh, planning, like colonial urban planning, the white white supremacy, like the settler state, and capitalism. I I think well, wonderful presentations, firstly. Um, and secondly, I'm really thinking through, and you all have already talked about this, but the really deep connections between Mackenzie and Delaney's work. Um, and so I, I, I was wondering, um, maybe I'm kind of reading this incorrectly, but I'm, but I'm wondering um, that Delaney, you're, you're talking in some ways about the, the ways that um, 
people navigate space. And then um, Mackenzie, I think you're talking also um, the ways that space is sort of um, uh, uh, fits or, or bears upon people. So I'm wondering if you all can kind of speak on, on the connections between how you all are, are navigating each other's work, some of the connections you all see between your work. And then Mackenzie specifically, I, I'm really struck by the James Dean photo that you that you included there, as, even as a way to, to kind of talk through and kind of connect to, to Delaney's work. So I wondered um, if you could speak a little bit on that photo in particular. It actually reminds me of a Walt Whitman photo that, you know, the really famous Walt Whitman photo of him sort of leaning against, um, you know, really, really casually as well in, in the, um, the cover of, of um, Leaves of Grass. So if you could speak a little bit more on um, why you chose that photo in particular and how it might even kind of connect to some of the um, some of the things that Laney's talking about around the kind of normative bodies and the way that space produces difference and, and normativity. Etc. Well, to talk about like the postmodern body, um, kind of the the body became like a major kind of focal point symbol um, for kind of like the the larger kind of social and cultural happenings um, of of that time, and so like there was a lot of focus on the body in the media and and artists were exploring the body in terms of like um, gender kind of associations and that sort of thing. There was also a lot of focus on the body with the uh, media that was coming from the war in Vietnam. So it was, um, so it was very, very much political. And then, um, so posture, I think, um, and, and I didn't get into this, but posture really kind of symbolizes, um, I think, I don't wanna say like, decay so to speak although that's what it says in the in the source I'm thinking of um but it it kind of the relaxation of posture um symbolizes like uh how culture like started to favor like leisure so to speak um and so like these etiquette standards were actually relaxing but then at the same time that that was happening um and that like it was kind of becoming more um like it started kind of in the 20s with like the flappers and it was like very much like commentary on um the social and cultural kind of um environment um that was kind of rejecting like the the very kind of upright uptight thing so then uh in the 1960s and 70s we kind of see like characters you know um or famous people like really embracing this, um, James Dean, Clint Eastwood, and then that uh, kind of contraposto stance that I mentioned um, and that that picture shows uh, kind of symbolized like a rejection of like authority or like kind of a power structure kind of thing where it was like relaxing actually became like a way to kind of like show dominance, so to speak, um, instead of like being upright. So, but at the same time that posture was kind of like that society was allowing it to re relax, there were still like, there becomes like this kind of like pseudo medical stuff happening where doctors are saying like, no posture is like, a, a, that's like related to all of your health. So it was like, there's, there's kind of this fight happening between like the kind of social and cultural aspect of posture versus like the kind of medical or like status symbol that, that in a very like upright posture was yeah that's a crazy kind of map of explanation but yeah perhaps one final question available to us in chat from Pfizer I hope I pronounced that correctly and the question is for Claire Claire do you think literature approaches LGBTQ I characters in the same way that Western media does in other words is there a shift between kind of the literature we read and the films we watch in terms of representation? Yeah, um, it's actually like, there's a super interesting relationship between the two. Obviously the motion picture production code related directly to like Hollywood and to film and TV. Um, and that influenced literature for sure, but um, didn't directly like stop things from getting published. Um, you can, I mean, from far back, you can see how the publishing uh, 
industry like affected the way that things were published. If you think of like Little Women, um, they wouldn't allow Little Women to be published unless Joe was married at the end, especially because she was kind of queer coded and seen as potentially not a straight character. And so like uh, Louisa May Alcott had to marry Joe off in order to get that book published. Um, the first example of a like actual lesbian story where the characters didn't die at the end is actually Carol, um, which was originally, that was the movie with Kate Blanchett, um, but it was originally a book called The Price of Salt and it was released in the 50s. So while the um, Hays Code was going on and censoring things in Hollywood. So that was pretty remarkable to have that be released. Um, but then also there were books that were affected by it like E.M. Forrester's Morris. Um, that was not able to be published until after Ian e. Forrester died in 1971. Um, and so it did affect and didn't affect in the same way as the film industry was affected, um, which is really interesting. But um, in the same way, I'm looking at um, kind of a lot of books as well, where the topic of shame is tackled. One of my favorite books is called Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe. I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but um, specifically talks about shame and how this character was so like affected by the shame of his society that he didn't even realize he was gay until like literally the last like chapter of the book. Um, like it was so buried deep within him. So that's also, it's similar to kind of the shows that I was talking about where shame is tackled, where that's like specifically an issue that's brought up. Um, and then what did Lindy say? Yeah, so um, yes, there, I have noticed a difference between US and foreign media. For example, like I talked about the birdcage, the French film um, is very more uh, the attitude of liberation and when it was brought over to, I mean, that's still Western world, but um, when it was brought over to America, the, it, was, it was changed. And I think that um, a lot of LGBT people find a lot of um, representation in the media by watching foreign films. I've watched like probably an inordinate amount of foreign films and foreign TV shows just to get representation. Um, and a lot of the media that I've looked at, like SCOM, the Norwegian show, um, uh, that specifically emphasizes liberation over this assimilation mindset has been from countries outside of the US. So yeah, that's a great question. Excellent, and thank you for a great answer. Um, I'm sitting here wondering what you guys might do with a text like Giovanni's Room, as an example by James Baldwin. It seems across a number of of lines of interest that I'm hearing here. But this is also the close of this amazing momentous moment. So I want to thank you all for allowing me to be participant and to hear such incredible research going on around me. It really is um, enlightening and um, very, very much pushes me to be a better uh, researcher, and in fact, a better teacher and scholar, if you will. So I greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm sure that I can say that for all the professors I'm looking at right now, um, and hopefully for each of you as you're working with each other, that this is how great things happen in the world. I do deeply appreciate it. So thank you very much. I then return this to Dr. Fakan and Dr. Mills and Lindy Villa. Dr. Floyd, thank you so much. Um, I don't think I could say anything more to that except to thank you very much for being a wonderful facilitator. Um, to the four presenters, um, that was um, stimulating, invigorating, um, and just incredible, incredible work. Um, I learned so much today. Um, thank you so much.